Well, I often tell a story from my past uh, to kind of make an illustration about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, in 1979, I was 14 years old, and we had, uh, our family had been, uh, we went on vacation to Yellowstone National Park. How many have ever been to Yellowstone National Park? Several of you have. Uh, a lot of you have seen pictures of that beautiful, beautiful place. And Yellowstone National Park uh, was where we were headed with a group of students from our school. So um, I had determined that as soon as possible, I felt like it was my duty as a 14-year-old skull full of mush, I thought that my duty was to pet a buffalo. How many have ever petted a buffalo before? Anybody ever pet a buffalo? Okay, that's a very unusual thing to do, isn't it? Okay, so I determined. Now, they told us that in Yellowstone National Park, there's a lot of dangers. There are a lot of danger zones. Uh, there are a lot of things that can kill you. The hot springs and geysers can kill you. I mean, literally, you can fall in and die, all right? Um, bears can kill you. Elk, moose, uh, all kinds of wolves and different kind of animals will uh, just, you enter into a danger zone when you get close to them, and uh, the park rangers told us to stay away, but particularly, they told us, do not go near the buffalo. Do not go near the buffalo. Now, for me, that sounded like a challenge. 14 years old, once again, uh, a kid just doing my own thing. And so we were there, and we finally found a herd of buffalo out there in the middle of the park. I mean, no fence, no nothing, just all these buffalo. And our, our group pulled over, and the group got out of the van. Well, because they were watching everybody and kind of looking around and noticing the beauty, um, I kind of broke away from the group. Remember, my job as a 14-year-old kid was to pet a buffalo. That was my job, all right? The park ranger had told me not to do it. He said it was dangerous, uh, that the buffalo could and would kill me uh, if I was not careful. And so, anyway, I ignored the park ranger, and so I began to try to get close to a buffalo. Now, there's a whole herd of them, but there's one that had kind of broken away from the, the herd a little bit. And so I'm sneaking up. Now, I don't know why I'm sneaking, because... The entire herd of buffalo can see me. They're looking at me like, what is this idiot doing, all right? And so I'm sneaking up on this buffalo. I get within 30 feet, and the smell is atrocious. I mean, the smell, if you ever smelled one, you know that they, they do not smell very good at all. So I'm reaching out 30 feet. Why you reach out your hand at 30 feet away, I do not know because I'm not the plastic man. I cannot stretch you know, like Stretch Armstrong from the 80s. I cannot do that. So anyway, here I am trying to pet a buffalo, and I'm within 20 feet, and I'm getting close. It smells bad. I'm within 10 feet. I'm getting closer. It's getting more dangerous. It's smelling bad. I get within about six or seven feet, and all of a sudden, the entire herd of buffalo take off running in the other direction. Now, about that same time, uh, a park ranger stopped and watched our group, and he threatened to kick us out of the park because I was trying to pet a buffalo. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever tried to pet a buffalo? Now, I don't mean literally. I mean, because most people probably haven't done that. Even though I tried, I still have never petted a buffalo, even though I've been to Yellowstone National Park, and I was within six or seven feet of a whole herd of buffalo. But I tried to pet a buffalo, but didn't do it. Now, here's the point. I was in a danger zone. In fact, the park ranger told me it was very, extremely dangerous. I could have lost my life. Here I was, a 14-year-old kid, and maybe I'm not fully aware of what I'm doing. Maybe it's just because I'm a kid. Maybe it's because I'm taking a dare from someone else. But the fact is, I was trying to pet a buffalo. I was entering into a danger zone where I should not have been. You know, the Bible talks about the financial danger zone. That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. 
a financial danger zone. That may not be exactly what you think. Uh, some of it is because we don't pay attention to our finances. We don't pay attention to our spending. Other uh, parts of it has to do with our relationship with God. But nevertheless, we enter into a financial danger zone. Have you ever entered a financial danger zone? You ever just drive by the new car lot? You've got a car. You still have payments that you owe on it. If you were to trade it in, you, were to be up, you would be upside down in that car. But in spite of that, because of the new car smell, you get that car, you're upside down in your car payment, and you know what you're doing? You're petting a buffalo. You're entering into a danger zone, a place that you have no business entering. You, you ever get really smart? You owe a lot of credit card debt, and you get another credit card so that you can pay off the credit card that you owe. That sounds smart. You just kind of switch them back and forth, but that is petting a buffalo. When you do that, you're entering a financial danger zone. You're entering into a zone that you should not be. You ever just try to um, uh, rack up credit card debt? You ever let spending creep just kind of sneak up on you? The fact is, you get a raise. You've been needing that raise to get your finances in order. But as soon as you get the raise, you spend it all. Have you ever noticed that we have a tendency to do that? If you make $25,000 a year, you know what you do? You spend all of it. If you make $50,000 a year, you know what people do? They spend it all. Even the people that used to make $25,000, now they make $50,000. And what, what do they do? Do they save any of it? Do they, uh, do they budget that? Nope. They just kind of like, hey, I got extra money. I'm going to spend it. You know what they're doing? They're petting a buffalo. And what you and I do, and metaphorically speaking, when we enter into that financial danger zone, we are entering into a zone that God never intended for us to be in. And so today I want to just challenge you for a little bit that you not enter that financial danger zone. Did you know that the Bible has more to say about money than any other subject? There are over 2,500 verses in the Bible about money. Now, not all of them are about spending or giving or whatever. Some of them are just in a story about a financial transaction or in a story about money but the fact is the Bible has more to say about money than it does about faith than it does about grace than just about any other subject you know why because I believe it's because uh, God knows that we will spend the majority of our lives either earning managing spending or enjoying money it is a huge part of our life now if you have, like most people, you have to have a job, you're going, to, you're going to spend a lot of your time earning money. The Bible is pretty clear that it's okay to earn money. We should earn money. And so the Bible is filled with verses about how we are to manage our money, how that we're to avoid a financial danger zone. In fact, the Bible talks about how that our attitude toward money affects our relationship with God. Let me just give you a, a few breakdowns on there are 271 key passages on money in the Bible. Um, now there are more verses than that, but these are passages where there may be several verses. First, the first uh, is, is there are 88 passages that talk about earning it honestly. There are 88 passages in the Bible that talk about being honest in your earnings. Why is that important? Because it's okay to earn money. There's no limit on what you can earn and be right with God. There's no prohibition on having a big paycheck or being wealthy or earning money or having stuff. Nothing wrong with that at all. But the Bible talks about earning it honestly. Uh, there are also 70 passages about giving it generously. So those two things are tied together. You need to earn it and be honest in your earnings. You can earn as much as you want. You, can, you need to be honest in your earnings. And when you're dealing with that, then you also need to be generous in your giving. The, the next number of verses is 49. And those are 49 passages that warn us about how money can destroy you. You ever notice that money can 
suddenly take over your life? You know, it's funny, before I ever made any money, it never really bothered me. When I started making a paycheck, I became very, 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 very concerned about it. And I don't know if you're that way or not, but it tends to be true that the more money we make, the more we worry about it. The more money we make, the more stress we have. We think we want more money, but the fact is, often, the more we have, the more we're stressed out about it, and the more bothersome it becomes, and we begin to guard it, we begin to be selfish, if you will, with it, and it begins to dominate our lives. And God says you cannot serve both God and money. In other words, you've got to have a right relationship with God more so than a right relationship with money. There are 18 passages, I'm sorry, 32 passages about utilizing money effectively. There are 18 passages about enjoying it carefully. Some people believe that God wants them to go through life with no joy, with no pleasure, being broke. You know, there's absolutely nothing spiritual about being broke. There's nothing spiritual about being rich either, okay? It is how our relationship with money defines our relationship with God. And then there are 14 passages on multiplying it faithfully. Why would God want us to know how to multiply it? Well, I believe it's to leverage it for the kingdom of God. And God wants every person, no matter what your relationship with money is, no matter how much of it you earn, uh, he wants you and me to make sure that we multiply it for God's sake, for the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be, uh, you know, a, a, a wealthy uh, investor. That doesn't mean that you're going to own a jet. That doesn't mean that you're going to be a multimillionaire, but rather that you manage it carefully and that you multiply what God gives you so that you can invest not only in your family, but in the kingdom of God. Well, let me read to you today a passage that makes very clear about how money affects our relationship with God. It's found in Luke chapter 12 and verses 15 through 21. And this is, this is Jesus talking. These are the words of Jesus. And he said to them, take care and, do, and, uh, and be on guard against all covetousness. Now think about that for a minute. Not just covetousness, all covetousness. And why does he say that? Well, obviously, there's more than one way for you to be caught up and to be tricked by covetousness. It's deceitful. It's a greedy little thing. And so God says, take care. Jesus said, take care. Make sure that you don't get deceived by this. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. If we got nothing else but that today it would be a good day in church. If we got nothing else but that truth that your life, my life, does not, it does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. We are more than our house. We are more than the kind of car we drive. Our value is much greater than the kind of clothes we wear. God says that you are more valuable than anything on this planet. You know why? He gave his only son to die for you. You are valuable in the eyes of God. So be careful, he says, about all covetousness. Well, then he goes on and he tells this story. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I will now, uh, for I, I, know where, I have nowhere to store my crops and he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And uh, there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool. Now that's rather harsh, isn't it? Does anybody see anything wrong with what this man did? He was a careful planner. He multiplied his income. 
He was going to be taking care of his household. He was following a budget. He did what the Bible talks about in many places about how to manage his money. So what was the problem? What was the problem? We're going to discover that in just a moment. God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? In other words, the temporary nature of money, the temporary nature of wealth. You know what Jesus could have said, and, and it would have made the same point, you can't take it with you. That's what Jesus was saying. You can't take it with you. In fact, I want us all to say that together. Ready? You can't take it with you. Now, uh, I want you to act like you're paying attention in church now, okay? I, I realize you're probably looking at, uh, you know, net, you're not Netflix, but you're looking at Facebook and trying to figure out something you're going to watch when you get home. But listen, let's say it again. You can't take it with you. It's a powerful principle. The other one being that your life is more than your possessions. So God is showing us here some very important principles that will help us in our relationship with money. Now, let me just give you three thoughts and we're done on how to avoid the financial danger zone. From this passage of Scripture, how do we avoid the financial danger zone? Well, first of all, you need to guard your heart. Guard your heart. That's what Jesus said. Guard your heart. Did you know he's talking about covetousness here? Covetousness has no place in the Christian life. In fact, it's really, really interesting. In the Ten Commandments, God gives the Ten Commandments. And I realize that we don't keep the commandments to be made right with God. Jesus kept the commandments for us. And the fact is, uh, you and I, we are supposed to keep the commandments, but that is not what makes us right with God. We're made right by the grace of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. However, we still are supposed to keep the Ten Commandments. How many believe that it's wrong to murder? Raise your hand. Anybody believe that? Well, we should keep that commandment. Wouldn't you agree with that? How many believe it's wrong to steal? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody should. Hopefully your hand is raised. Uh, the fact is, it's wrong to steal. We should keep that commandment. Now, the interesting thing is, that the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. He says, don't worship any other God but me. He tells us to make sure that we keep the Sabbath day. We're not to take God's name in vain. And uh, we're not to have any graven images, any idols in our life. And then he goes on and talks about our relationship with uh, uh, mankind through our parents. Honor your parents. And he goes on and talks about our relationship with others. He talks about don't steal. Don't kill. Don't bear false witness. It would be impossible to have a judicial system, a governmental system that worked if there was not prohibitions against lying under oath or against being a liar when it comes to the court system. And that principle is about being honest. He says don't commit adultery and uh, so on and so forth, okay? But the very last commandment doesn't seem like it fits. I mean, if I were making up the top ten... I would probably put something in there other than don't covet because that doesn't seem to be very bad at all. That seems to be very benign. But the truth of the matter is that last commandment, that 10th commandment deals with our relationship with God. You see, the root sin behind covetousness is this, that I am dissatisfied with what God has provided and I'm unthankful for it. That's what covetous really, covetousness really is. I am dissatisfied with what God has provided, and I'm unthankful. And so when that happens, God says it affects your relationship with God. Now, let's think about this. Have you ever seen a 16-year-old young man driving up in a brand-new Porsche automobile? Sports car worth about $80,000 and uh, you, he's the boss's son. And when you look at that 16-year-old kid, I'm sure the first thought that goes through your mind is, what an industrious, hardworking young man. Anybody ever think that? No. You know what we do? We say things like, 
must be nice. And we say things like, that little brat. I mean, he hadn't worked a day in his life, and, and he's got that Porsche, and I'm driving a 1973 Pinto station wagon. What is wrong with this picture? Well, here's the point. God wants us to be thankful for what he provides, but he also wants us to trust him. See, the sin of covetousness is when we are dissatisfied with God and his provision, and ultimately, it is a kind of self-worship where we worship self rather than God. There are three Hebrew words used in the Old Testament for covetousness. One means uh, desiring your neighbor's possessions. In other words, they got it, but you want it. Not that you want to better yourself, not that you want something nice for yourself, but you see what they have, and it just gets all over you, and you're like, I got it. Either you want what they have so they don't have it, or you want something better than what they have to rub it in their face. That's covetousness. And one of the words means that kind of desiring your neighbor's possession. Another one of those words means that you desire dishonest gain. You see something, somebody else had it, and no matter what the price, I've got to have it. I want that. And then another one of the words uh, for covetousness in the Old Testament is an inordinate, selfish desire that is not concerned for others. Now, remember the man that Jesus told in the story that God said to him in the story, he said, tonight, your soul's gonna be required of you and you're a fool because you're not rich toward God. What was his problem? His problem was not that he didn't manage his money properly. His problem was not that he just, you know, wanted more for himself. He had a good financial plan. His problem was that in his finances, he did not include God in them. And as a result, he became very self-centered and very selfish. Now, I'm going to tell you there are three things that will help you to overcome all covetousness. Jesus said, be aware of all covetousness. We are, to be guard, we are to be on guard for all of it, the kind that desires our neighbor's uh, stuff, the kind that uh, is just got this inordinate desire for something illicit or something that maybe we shouldn't have, or we want what everybody else has, or we're completely selfish. We forget that God has blessed us, and rather than being generous and concerned about others, we're only concerned about self. Now, that is covetousness. And there are three things that we do, according to Scripture, that will battle covetousness. Because I'm going to tell you, you don't know if another person is greedy or covetous or not. I mean, maybe if you talk to them and you, you can find out. But normally, it's the human response that the way we see others as being covetous or the way we see them as being greedy is because they got more stuff than we do. You look at it. And once again, just using these kind of numbers. Let's say you make $25,000 a year. And you, somebody that is in your neighborhood, somebody that you work with, they make $50,000 a year. Now that person could be the most unselfish person you've ever met in your life. But we have a tendency to think they're greedy because they make more money than we do. And it just goes, uh, you know, if you make 50000 you think the person making 100000 is greedy or covetous. If you make 100000 you think the person making 200000 And it just keeps on going because our sinful nature just thinks that others are covetous simply because they have more than we do. But that is not the way that you combat covetousness. You can be in poverty level and still be covetous, still be greedy. There are three things that will break the bond of covetousness in your life. And here they are. Uh, number one, when you are thankful for what God has provided for you. So in other words, you want to combat covetousness? Be thankful for what God has provided for you. Number two, uh, when you bring the tithe 
And I'm going to tell you this, it is, and I'm going to make a bold statement here. It is impossible, in my opinion, to be guilty of being covetous and bring the tithe at the same time. It just doesn't work. When I allow God to build my faith, where I bring the tithe, you know what God does? He works in my life, so he breaks the bond, the, uh, the chokehold of covetousness. So the way to combat covetousness is to be thankful for what God has provided, is to bring the tithe, and then uh, the third way is not to be self-centered or stingy, to live in a way where you are concerned about others. Now, interestingly, some of the most generous people I've ever known are not wealthy. In fact, I'll go so far as to say the majority of the most generous people I know are probably middle class, some lower middle class, some a little bit higher middle class, but they're people that are not wealthy. They're people that are not rolling in the dough, but they have learned to be thankful for what God has given them, and they, in turn, are concerned about others. So your concern for others is not about how much. It's about the heart. And when I'm thankful for what God has done for me, it changes my attitude. I can bring the tithe, and I can be generous and helpful to other people. I'm concerned about their plight, not just my own selfish stuff in life. And therefore, God, in that way, helps me combat covetousness. Well, that's the majority of my sermon. I'm going to give you a couple thoughts that are just kind of secondary. Because Jesus, what he was talking about was battling covetousness and how we battle that. Here's the second thing he's talking about. He's talking about planning carefully. If you want to avoid a financial danger zone, you got to make sure that you guard your heart. And then you got to plan carefully. There are lots of scriptures I could read here about... Um, your plan of what that looks like, what it should look like. Um, Proverbs 27, 23, and 24, riches can disappear fast, so watch your business interests closely. Know the state of your flocks and your herds. Proverbs 21, 20, the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On every Lord's day, you should put aside something from what you have earned during the week and use it for this offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. Hebrews 13, 5. Be content with what you have. Isaiah 52, 5. Why spend money on what does not satisfy? You ever do that? I've been guilty of it. And I like, you know, think I've got to have this particular thing. And I'll spend it, and then I realize I wasted my money. And I've told you stories about that stuff before. I, uh, you know, I, uh, years ago, I had to have two leaf blowers. I don't know why, but I spent money on what does not satisfy. Now, fortunately, that was not a huge investment uh, that I lost my shirt over. But the fact is, we're all guilty of that at times. Why spend money on what does not satisfy? And God says that I've got to plan carefully. If you don't plan to give, you won't. If you don't plan to live by a budget, you won't. If you don't plan to save, you won't. I know. I've been there before. And you've got to be disciplined and follow a plan. And then here's the last thing that God says to us. We need to be rich toward God. Be rich toward God. Jesus said in his story, he called the man a fool, and he said, so are those who are rich toward themselves, but not rich toward God. Now, what does it mean to be rich toward God? Uh, 1 Timothy 6 talks about it. It says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. In other words, net worth does not equal self-worth. Your value does not come from how much money you have in the bank. Don't be haughty. He says, nor set your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. In other words, security does not come from your bank account. It comes from God. And then 
He says, uh, who richly, God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. In other words, God owns everything and provides generously for us. He will provide for you when you follow him. And then he says, tell them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. He's saying that God owns everything. We can enjoy life. We can enjoy the blessings of God, but we need to focus on doing the right thing. We need to focus on doing good works. We need to focus on helping others, helping others in need. We need to learn to gain a, an eternal perspective. That's what he's saying. He said, tell them to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. God's telling us here, set your hope on the giver, not the gift. Now, God is very clear that we need to learn how to make sure that we are focusing on others, that we're focusing on our relationship with God, that we're being rich toward God. Well, today, this has been kind of a very practical type of message, but I hope you've learned something today of what it means to be greedy or to be covetousness and how we can combat that, what it means to be concerned about others, what it means to be rich toward God, what it means to have a plan in your life, to guard your life, to guard your finances, to guard your relationship with God. And when we do that, I believe that God not only will bless us financially, but he will bless us in our relationship with him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for Jesus. And I thank you that, Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins. You died so that we could be made right with you. And God, you gave us a way to be able to be in right standing with you, Heavenly Father. And we thank you for that. And Lord, I pray for anyone today that's watching online, they've joined us this way, or is present in the room today, that if they have not received Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they would do it today. Right now, while we are praying together, God, I pray that you let them know that you love them, that you said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And God, I pray that you'd show them that if they will call on you, that you love them so much that not only will you make them right with the Heavenly Father, but you will forgive their sins. You will redeem them, and you'll make them right with you. If you'd like to do that today with our head bowed, I'm going to invite you to pray something like this. It's a simple prayer, but it's calling out to God for salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe Jesus died on the cross for our sins. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he rose from the grave. And I'm asking him to save me, to forgive me, and to come into my life right now. In Jesus' name. If you did that online today, I want to challenge you. Let us know. Check that you prayed to receive Christ. Fill out the next step. Fill out uh, your next step card and let us know that you pray to receive Christ. If today you did that in the room today, I want to encourage you to take the next step card, check it, and drop it in the box on the way out today. I want you to look right this way for just a moment. I'm going to have one more simple prayer, and then we're going to be finished. In a message like this today, it's really easy to kind of say, hey, go get them. Yeah, that's what everybody else needs to hear. When in actuality, it's what we need to hear. It's what I need to be aware of. Even for people that are very good financially and they have a very good plan, they tithe, they're, they're generous, it is important to be reminded of this because it is very easy, have you ever noticed this? It's very easy to be focused on nothing but you. Nothing but your problems. Nothing but your family or your friends. And I wonder today if I could pray for you. I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I don't want to pet the buffalo. I don't want to be the one that gets into the 
the danger zone. I want to avoid that, whether I'm already good at doing it or not. And I want to be aware, and I want to focus on making sure that my finances reflect my relationship with God. Is anybody like that today? You pray something along that line? Let's pray that. Let's, let's do that. Let's, let's take that together. I mean, if this is something that you and I, I need it, I'm sure you need it, and we need to claim this together. Amen? 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 I'm going to keep on saying amen until you say it. Amen? Amen? All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for teaching us about how that we can avoid the danger zone, that we can avoid uh, getting tripped up, that we can avoid covetousness. Father, I thank you for loving us and providing for us and making a way for us. I pray for those in our church that are struggling financially. There are some, and, and there could be many. Some during this um, coronavirus, they've lost income. Some have lost their jobs. I pray that you provide for them. There are others that were just about to get ahead financially, and this thing just turned them for a loop. And I pray that you'd help them to not give in to keep on trusting you, to believe that you are going to be there and provide for them and help them, and you have a plan for their life. And God, I pray that you'd help us to be concerned about others. And Lord, we want you to know that we love you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.